Well, welcome everyone to this London Art Week Art History in Focus event. First off, I need to let you know that this talk will be recorded and available on the London Art Week YouTube channel from early November. We welcome you to submit your um, questions and comments um, in the box below and um, we can get started. My name is Rachel Elwes, and I am a director at Ben Elwes Fine Art in London, where we are exhibiting the extraordinary monumental paintings by Amara Bolivian artist, Alejandro Mario Llanas. These jaw-dropping works have not been seen for the last 30 years and are being exhibited in the United Kingdom for the first time ever. I am pleased to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Michelle Greet is Professor of Modern Latin American Art History at George Mason University in Virginia. Amongst her publications, she is author of Beyond National Identity, Pictorial Indigenism as a Modernist Strategy in Andean Art, 1920 to 1960, published by Penn State University Press in 2009. She also wrote the introduction for Ben Elwes Fine Arts Exhibition Catalog, which can be accessed through our website. I would also like to introduce you to Carolina Scarborough, who is an arts professional specializing in Latin American art. She devised a seven panel virtual series on the subject of historical Bolivian artistic and cultural production. This was the first time such a comprehensive series dedicated entirely to Bolivian art was presented to New York audiences. Over the next 45 minutes, our speakers will be talking about Yanis and will share their insights into his unique world in the wider context of modern Latin American art. Without further ado, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel, and good morning and good afternoon to everyone, <laughs> depending on where you are. Um, thank you again, Rachel, for that introduction. And I also want to thank Silke Lohman and Luz Garrix for, and, our, and all their team for inviting me to London Art Week. Well, Michelle, what a wonderful opportunity to be with you again and to present a truly forgotten artist and not one very well known even in Bolivia which is some something somewhat rare nowadays right so Michelle can you please tell us about Alejandro Mario Llanes and what his works really mean in the context of Bolivian art history and the larger um, Latin American modern art history well, thank you so much. I'm just going to say it's a pleasure to be here today. And it was such a pleasure to discover this artist um, whom I didn't know, even as a specialist in Andean indigenism. Uh, so I wanted to start with these two prints. Um, and these two prints are uh, self-portraits. And so uh, they form a basis to tell us a little bit about who was um, Alejandro Mario Llanes. Um, Llanes um, was a self-trained artist uh, who was from the area of Oruru of, in uh, Bolivia, who um, was an artist working in the style known as indigenismo or indigenism. Uh, and I'm going to speak a little bit about that with, through the next couple of slides. Uh, but Mario, I mean, Alejandro Mario Llanes uh, was, his mother was Aymara and his father was of mixed race, and he was orphaned at the age of 12. And so this had a major impact on his ability to train. He worked in the tin mines, funded his um, schooling, originally studied to be a lawyer, and then um, moved on to working in art, having his first exhibition in the in Oruru in 1930. Um, these prints are a little bit later, um, but they show us who he was, this kind of brooding um, artist who, you know, he looks at the very, um, he's, he's, he's solemn and intellectual. Uh, and we can see someone who is again, a very serious uh, person who we will start to learn about through his uh, works. Uh, so I wanted to start with one image. Um, I think you saw this actual image behind uh, Rachel. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about um, this one, um, Carolina. Um, yeah. This is one of the earliest works that we have by Ilianes. 
Uh, and we, this is the painted version, but he also made a mural of this work at the um, Warisata school. Uh, and so you can see here that he is depicting the people around him in the Lake Titicaca region. Um, he's depicting the, the labor um, in this reed boat on the lake, um, but it's also a very stylized picture. Yeah, and actually what, you know, what a great, painting not only because of its early you know period you chose but like also the emblematic uh, Lake Titicaca you know it's like very sacred and and I don't use these words lightly even I even forget you know Know, the importance of uh, the lake, you know, for even from an ecological perspective, you know, you have things like 90% of the, fi the fish species are endemic, and it was these, uh, it was designated as Ramsar by the UNESCO, which is Ramsar are wetlands that are highly important internationally. And for the Incas, and and also it must be sacred for Illanes, I, you know, I believe in some way because they would often throw during very important rituals a lot of offerings into the lake. So I mean, like as you said, it depicts like this, the sacred lake, the the Incas, the Aymaras, and you know the and um, and all of them working as well, right, in the reed boats. So I wanted to situate um, Yanis a little bit in the larger historiography of what was happening in the Andes uh, during this huh. period and why he was such an amazing discovery um, for me. Um, so I want to tell you, first mm -hmm. of all, a little bit about um, indigenismo. Um, so indigenism essentially has two definitions. Um, one definition is um, artwork that depicts the indigenous population of the region as a way of sort of elevating this, this subject matter of indigenous peoples to a, a valued topic of high art. But around the mid 1920s, um, a second definition of indigenismo emerged, um, defined by the scholar and intellectual um, Jose Carlos Mariategui, who was a writer and a journalist, um, and he made indigenismo a much more political um, type of art making. It was a movement in art and literature and in activism to basically vindicate um, the indigenous masses, to look at the indigenous peoples as workers, um, as part of a class structure within the Andes. Um, and this philosophical outlook had a major impact on art making. So much of my research has been on Ecuador, and I'm comparing here with the artist Eduardo Kingman, you can see the dates are almost exactly the same. Um, mm -hmm. Eduardo Kingman was looking at the in, in the indígenas and the mestizos as workers um, and laborers um, and looking at their relationship to larger um, kind of class structures. And so in the case of Kingman, you see that ship um, in the background and the, the small laborer is working to bring um, their their wares to the ship, and there's a, definitely a hierarchy. Yanis hasn't gotten there yet, but we're going to see um, very, very quickly, he becomes wrapped up in this much more politicized indigenismo. Um, and so in this picture, I would say the Lake Titicaca picture is an image that um, is decorative, but verges on showing this work as um, this person as a laborer. Um, so I want to show you a few more pictures of comparison. So I'm comparing him here um, to Cecilio Guzman de Rojas, who was a Bolivian artist and also the director, not at this point when this was made, but he became the director of the National School of Fine Arts, yes. um, who painted in a much more symbolist mode. Um, he painted indigenous peoples as elongated and decorative and beautiful um, and situated in the landscape, but not so much in a political way. This is not the indigenous peoples as laborers, but more as a kind of symbolic Adam and Eve, the progenitors of um, a larger tradition. And so I think here, Yanis is in between the two. Um, you can see that the, his sky and his um, his movement is decorative on um, the, the landscape. You can see the the boats and the textiles in the bottom. He must have known Cecilio Guzman de Rojas's work. Um, there's clearly and, a visual connection here. Yeah, go ahead, Carolina. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, I think you're spot on. And I think this juxtaposition, I, I think it's so perfect and beautiful. In the context of Bolivia, I mean, you. I think you could have not mentioned Illanes without mentioning Guzman de Rojas. And 
And I think um, the two views on indigenous are very interesting and it, and it, and it makes sense. You know, Guzman de Rojas was belonged to the to the white elite minority. And of course, and he was educated and educated in the Western European uh, you know, mindset. So of course he's gonna, you described it so beautifully, like this Adam and Eve and very stylized, right, indigenous. And what he did was basically bring to the forefront just, you know, indigenous figure, but mm -hmm. did not really contextualize it into this more biting political scene. Well, then you have Llanes, but but Maria Guzman de Rojas is like a reality, right, within Bolivia. And this other reality, this starkly, starking, like sort of polar reality is uh, Llanes, who's like mestizo, right, but uh, with a very strong, like, uh, Aymara heritage. And of course, he, like you said, he's um, in, in the the beautifully written text that you did for the, for the gallery. He is part of, he lived this backbreaking life as a minor right and he represents this other reality and that's what I think that's what really allows him to do that, that criticism but also very brave I mean I cannot even fathom or imagine how hard of it must have been for him during that time yeah the significance I think of this comparison is that the Art history in Bolivia has been dominated by the story of Cecilio Guzman de Rojas. Um, when I was doing my work on indigenism, and and that's and that's not to say that his work is not amazing, but I right. I never understood, I never knew that there was a politically motivated indigenism in Bolivia. Ilianes is the first example of this politically motivated um, indigenism that was very different mm -hmm. from the perspective of Guzman de Rojas. Um, I just threw in this picture so you can see this beautiful image up close mm -hmm. by Guzman de Rojas, but also keep it in mind as a contrast um, with that of Ilianes. And here's just one more example by Guzman de Rojas, so very famous one, the Cristo yeah. and, and that And that's also very telling. It was from his period, well, this was after the Chaco War, and it was yeah. when he was looking at colonial art and doing this more ascetic. Um, and he actually, you know, he he looked very closely at Melchor Perez de Olguin, the great master. And he also even, I know that he um, conserved a lot of his works later on. So that, sir, that thanks to him survived today. So I think that one of the motivating factors um, for Ilianes was probably exposure to um, Jose Carlos Mariategui's journal Amauta, which was very, very politically motivated. And it was distributed throughout the Andes, the Latin American world, and even to Europe. Um, and so even if he didn't have direct access to this journal, he certainly had access to the literary world in, um, in Bolivia, where he would have learned about this much more politically motivated um, work. Um, just to further situate, I also wanted to just Compare, give a couple of images, a comparison of what was happening in the larger Andean world, and then we'll return to Ilianes. Um, here's mm -hmm. an example of indigenism in Peru. This is um, Jose Sabogal, um, the Indian mayor of Chincheros, and some of his prints. Um, Sabogal kind of like Cecilio Guzman de Rojas, was also not specifically political. Um, his images were more about kind of elevating um, the images of the indigenous peoples to put to the place of a subject matter of modern fine art. Um, and also a couple of examples from Ecuador where the ind indigenismo was very, very politically motivated. I have Eduardo Kingman on the left-hand side and Osvaldo Guayasamin. Um, so I show these images to place a larger context on Ilianes. Um, this this dialogue about indigenism of the representation of indigenous peoples and how they are represented within uh, this larger social um, context. So I'll put us back to an and, image by um, Ilianes that we can discuss in a little bit further depth. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, I totally agree with you, Michelle. I think you're spot on. I he must have known um, you know, um, Maria Tegui because uh, I think. You know, people forget that, but Oruro during that time was the, it was an extremely wealthy city because of the tin mm -hmm. extraction, and you had the famous uh, tin barons, right? Simon Patino, mm -hmm. Moritz Hochschild, and Carlos Aramayo, and the tin was also helping the efforts of World War II. I mean, Patino was considered not only the richest man in Bolivia but internationally, so that kind of you know gives you that scope, and mm -hmm. and then of course you did these. I mean, these paintings are, I think, so, so beautiful. If you can give us a little bit more context and I can give more of the, you know, 
Bolivian sort of uh, context. Uh, uh, yes, that sounds wonderful. So um, there are basically two directions of um, Yanis's work, and he and I wonder if I mean through and I should mention Amalta, Amalta produced republished in its pages works by Diego Rivera, the Mexican muralist. Um, and so Yanis would have had access to images before he even traveled to Mexico of the murals that Diego Rivera was doing. And one of the things that uh, Amalta published was images of the Secretary of Publication murals where Rivera divided his um, production into images of fiestas or um, popular or folk life and images of labor. Um, and we see that exact same division in Yanis's work. And so I'm starting here with an image of fiestas or popular local traditions. Um, and this is one that is known as Waka Torcoris or the dancing bulls. It's a carnival celebration um, that still goes on today in Oruru um, in Bolivia, um, where um, people dress up as bulls or the, the running of the bulls. And the figure on the left hand side is known as a, 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 a Mara clown. Um, it's Cusillo. Uh, and it is a very specific motif with kind of bug-like insect um, and, and, a, and a devil, um, kind of a trickster-like figure. Um, and so this is absolutely painted from um, knowledge of the region, but at the same time, it's stylized. I mean, you can see the stylized clouds um, and the landscape. And so he's kind of this combination of these bright colors, um, but looking very much at a specific local tradition. Yeah, and, and I think he's, uh, through these, he's really introducing us into his Aymara world, into the Aymara world, because these are, as he said, yes, these are carnival dances, but they date back to, cre to pre-Hispanic times, and, and the bull... And the bull rides were introduced by the Spanish, and these are the dancers are mocking the bull rides. So he's mm -hmm. kind of telling us, you know, that we have this very long inheritance that we've been we have been mocking the the ruling class, and uh, and as you <laughs> said, you mentioned the Cusillo too. He's a jester, and there was and it was also believed. Well, the mask is one of sort of the oldest sort of characters that we've had, but also he was a jester, and it was thought that he he the movements that he did like sort of comic represented sort of the in an ironic way um the defects of the mestizos and the white uh, people mm -hmm. and the white persons that were going into the Aymara world so you know this is as like you said as well he's presenting the symbolism and the rituals of the Aymara world so I wanted to, I'll show you a few more of these. And here is just an image of the size of these images in, in the gallery. Um, these are just absolutely gorgeous. They're, they're stunning in terms of their color and their size, uh, their monumentality. And through their monumentality, they show kind of a respect for um, this tradition and, and kind of elevate it to, through its size to this idea of fine art. Uh, but there were a couple of comparisons that I wanted to make here. I did bring in one of his drawings um, to show show that he um, he worked through his um, his compositions. And so he worked, he was looking and watching the movements of the dance. And you can see the fluidity of his line mm -hmm. um, in this preparatory drawing. And it's not directly a preparatory drawing. He, mu he must have made multiple image of, the, of these through this process of observation and then stylization. And then other sources were the exact observation. Again, you can see from the date here, this is much later mm -hmm. uh, from the 1980s. This is a living tradition. Um, but here I'm showing you a Kasiyu mask and, co and costume. Um, this is from the Aymara tradition. And you can see that his colors were not exaggerations. Um, his colors um, were yes. looking at this um, Bolivian tradition. Um, and so just to give you a sense of his source material, I put in a couple of Aymara textiles here, some of the Aymara hats um, from a around the same time period. Um, so his color palette um, was not just a modernist color palette, but it was a color palette that came from, again, the, the textiles, the ancient traditions, the, the, the lived traditions that he experienced through his everyday life that he adopted to uh, painting. Uh, and a few more wonderful Amara masks here. Again, not exactly the match to the ones in the picture, but just to get a sense of the type of source material that he was using. Um, and then I wanted to, and then I'll turn over again to the next image, but I wanted to just place this again in larger context. 
he was not the only artist in the Andes and in the Latin America who was starting to look at popular traditions as a source for modern art. Um, and so I've put in here Elena Isque, who was an artist from Peru, um, who was starting to look at um, pre-Columbian textiles as a source for her modern art, and then also the Mexican artist Adolfo Vestmogar, um, who was uh, developing a whole teaching method based on motifs from popular art and pre-Columbian traditions. So again, what I want to do with Yanis is say that he was not necessarily, I mean, he was a very singular artist, but he was working within a broader context of exploration of some of these ideas within Latin America, specifically the Andes and Mexico. Um, so that yeah. brings us to our next Yanis image. Um, so, yeah, absolutely no, and I, and I would agree with that. You know, like even you know the the textiles within Bolivia. I mean, the we they were influenced since prehistoric times. The you know they just found out there are a lot of the experts in textiles in Bolivia that have found out that a lot of the motifs were were like included into the textiles. And then you, this is such a beautiful example where you can see the textiles on the right on the foreground, but also again, sort of the symbolism that I, you know, that I want to bring back to are the, this dance is the surisikuri. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what the, the this refers to the hunt of the Surinandu, which was an ostrich, is an ostrich. I think um, I don't know if it's extinct by now, but they're they're playing the siku, which is the pan flip and the the pan uh, flute, and that's why they're they're called the sicuris. But what's really important here, again, uh, bringing back to sort of the textiles and the garments is the, you know, the garment, the chest cover that they are wearing, the males are wearing. It was originally made in jaguar skin. Nowadays, they still do them, but obviously not with jaguar skin. And the back are feathers. They're all feathers that, that were, feathers were incredibly important during Inca times because uh, all of their headdresses and garments were only the military, the religious and political elites would wear them. And what's interesting about this too is that they brought the feathers from the Amazon. So the Incas created these inter-ethnic um, exchange where they created these routes, these passages to bring these goods. And so, you know, th so this is, like uh, just the sort of level of sophistication of that time and that we still use it today, right? I think Ilanis is sort of, again, pointing to sort of the importance of this tradition and this Aymara world and sort of the symbolism, you know, and that we still have it today and it still um, exists today. I mean, there's such a wonderful combination in these images of the anthropological and the ethnographic, but at the same time, these are modern art images. Um, and so there's an accuracy to them, um, but he's finding inspiration in, you know, the energy and the patterns of these, these motifs to make um, an image that also relies on you know color distribution and um, you know composition, the flattening of the of the work that fit into a modern art tradition, um, and so they they really speak to two worlds um, where they are looking at regional context, but also um, you know writing these works into a larger modernist dialogue that is happening throughout Latin America. And I just wanted to mention the title of this piece, Kenas Kenas, which is referring to the 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 song that they're playing, the sadness of the song on the the reed of the reed pipe um that carolina described so um so mm -hmm. nicely mm -hmm. um so I wanted to I also put this image in just to kind of compare that with Diego Rivera, because both of these images that are three, all three of the images by Ilianes um, that I showed you fit into this idea of fiestas or popular traditions. And so Diego Rivera was doing the same thing at the Secretary of Public Education, um, painting images of fiestas. And here's just one example of the Judas, the burning of the Judases from that um, tradition. But Ilianes also um, dealt with the issue of labor. And there's a there is a you know, extreme contrast um, to his images of labor with the images of fiestas. And this one, of course, um, estaño malito or damn tin or cursed tin, um, it could translate, refers directly to his experience in the tin mines. Um, you know, the emaciated and contorted bodies, the darkness of the image that kind of captures um, the dim light in the mines, you know, the straining muscles. I mean, this is, this is not an image that 
that glorifies this type of labor, um, but really shows the you know the bodily harm and the the what it does to the laborers in this particular time. So it's it's very much a plea for the the treatment of the better treatment of laborers. Absolutely. And what I wanted to bring to this, I think, is also a very important um, time, which was the Chaco time, the, the Chaco mm -hmm. War. I think yes. this was a very, uh, these were the formative years of Ilanes. And the Chaco War was extremely, was very important in what sense? On one hand, it like completely I mean, we lost the war, we were completely defeated, you know, there was this very um, defeatist sentiment, but at the same time, in a, in a very interesting way, what's important about this is that it was for the first time that the white elite minority, the mestizos, and the indigenous communities were fighting together and worked together for the first time for this one cause. And this brought awareness to the elite, you know, about sort of the, the, the polarization of these rea of the realities that the that Bolivia was living and what was incredibly interesting about this is that it created um what was interesting is that it created this incredible intellectual movement so you had um the, the and this was the these were the precursor of what later would become the 1952 revolution, which mm -hmm. is, if you remember, it was, if I think a lot of people don't know this, but the 1952 revolution was only one of three revolutions in the entire world, right? You have the Bolshevik, the 1952 revolution, and the 1959 Cuban revolution. But again, I think what was important is that Ilanes was one of these intellectuals, right? And that, that's why I think he did meet Maria Tegui, and then you had um, Augusto Céspedes, Victor Paz Estensoro, um, Juan Lechino Kendo. Juan Lechino Kendo was one of the, was the, the famous union leader, right? The, created the Bolivian Worker Center, the famous Central Obrera Boliviana. And mm. you had also um, Augusto Céspedes, who also wrote El Metal del Diablo, Sangre Mestiza, Crónicas mm. de una Guerra Estúpida. So they were all like criticizing. They all had this social democrat sort of of thinking that would lead them in the end to the 1952 revolution. And he is depicting this like struggle, what they went through the war, what the, the serfdom, right? That, that later on for the first time ever, the, the, the you know, the land would be redistribu redistributed. Mm -hmm. So I think this was so, these were his formative years. Yeah, the, I mean, incredible. the image is very much aligned with the political sentiment um, and the expression of, you know, resistance in that particular um, moment. Um, so again, I wanted to align these with Diego Rivera and his images of labor um, and show that, uh, you know, he was also depicting the worker, the struggles of the worker um, and at, at the service of a larger class struggle um, in the after in uh, in the aftermath of the Mexican Revolution. Um, and we also think that, and so we know that Ilianas was a great admirer of both Diego Rivera and Jose Clemente Orozco from um, Mexico. When he did travel to, he made two trips to Mexico, at least that's what, what it looks like from the archives. Um, from about 19, between 1937 and 1940, um, he went to um, Chile, Argentina, and then to Mexico City. And then again in 1946, he was in Mexico. So in that first trip, I think that was quite formative um, for his mm -hmm. um, knowledge of Rivera and Orozco and what he saw with their with those works. Um, and so that brings us, well, this actually, this is exactly within the context of what we were talking about. Um, Viva la Guerra, yeah. or Long the War, is of course referring to the Chaco War. Um, it's made a couple of years after, um, but it shows um, this, this on, on the left-hand side, the workers, on the right-hand um, side, the campesinos, or the, the people coming from the countryside and on the bottom, um, basically this idea that death does not discriminate. Um, you can see with, with the skull, yeah. um, the different types of, of hats, which indicate which kind of walk of society uh, and that bring these peoples together, um, united against um, the usurpation of land um, and the troubles that, that they are facing at that particular moment. And it's not, it's not specific, but it almost looks like a hammer and sickle on the top. Um, the yeah. hammer is, is explicit, um, but the, the um, 
staff um, is in the form of a sickle. And so the symbolism here is very much aligned with his political sensibility. Absolutely. And then like the sign in the back, it says, mm -hmm. no, obreros y campesinos, uh, workers and peasants, racionalismo económico. And I think it's also pointing out to that, that economic rationalism that he's mentioning there is, uh, again, like, um, he was a professor at the famous Warisata school, right? The, the, by this time had been, it's, started in 1931 so he had <laughs> mm -hmm. yes and you know 90 this was the 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 indigenous rationalism that it was like that they, that they were intellectuals right and he saw in showing side by side the workers which were also some of them mestizos and the indigenous people led by the Wipala, which is the the flag that one of them is holding which mm -hmm. is the indigenous flag and that it today is used as the indigenous um, to represent the indigenous community. Mm -hmm. So I this this I think this style and I'll just kind of go back and forth between these two images for a second. Um, the mm -hmm. the style of kind of the vertical format with building up these images. Uh, I think that's why I have a question mark after the date of nineteen thirty two here. I want to give a little bit of yeah. context. So this is um, the tragedia mm -hmm. del Pongo. Or the tragedy of the the Bongo or the indigenous uh, laborer from a certain the region of Bongo, um, yeah. and he is very much painting in the style of Diego Rivera. I'm going to come back to this larger image, but I wanted to put mm -hmm. this up. Um, I can't imagine that he would have painted the work on the left without having seen um, Diego Rivera's History of Mexico um, in the National Palace. There's so many commonalities between um, these pictures. Uh, so there's the, the stylistic format of kind of building up the picture in a vertical format um, with a kind of flattening out of the space, um, which it doesn't have a deep sense of depth there is the even the 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 hist historical format. So in the Rivera, and I'll point this out, he starts with the colonial era um, with the kind of med medieval armor, and then he builds up chronologically right. in a vertical format. We have the same thing in um, the Illanes, starting with the colonial era and the medieval armor, and then building up to exactly. a modern time with the Warisata school here. And he even has this placement of, in Mexico, it's the Mexican eagle. And over here on the left-hand side, it's the Andean condor um, or the condor. Yes. And mm -hmm. so I, I really think that there's a dialogue between these two pictures and he must have seen um, these pictures. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. No, no, I, no, no, no. I totally agree with you. I think 1932 seems a little too early to have, um, to, to have uh, done this. And, and I think in some ways, I think you, but the, he must he must have already seen in Mariategui some of Rivera's work, but I but from you said later on he did travel right to yes. um to Mexico and everything. And I think um and from everything that you're saying to me, it seems that uh, Rivera, Orozco, and uh, you know, all th th these artists were in some ways validating him, his you know, sort of uh, struggle, his uh, his idea of really presenting, depicting this stark um, reality. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think they sort of validated or sort of encouraged him in, man, in many ways because it must have been extremely hard for him, I think, during that period. Yeah. As good, you know, I think he was brilliant. He, like you mentioned, he was exhibited throughout Bolivia, but it still must have been like start, like very, very hard. And I think that that leads us to his, um, you know, the circumstances of his first trip to Mexico. So I wanted to take a moment, since you can see it very small in the top um, right hand mm -hmm. corner, to talk a little bit about the Warisata School, uh, which was right. a school that was founded um, around 1932 in the Lake Titicaca region. Um, it was an experimental school um, for the education of the Aymara people, um, and it was founded on egalitarian and communitarian principles, uh, and also founded on basically the respect of the indigenous peoples, this acknowledgement that they were absolutely capable of intellectual learning. Um, but it was very much aligned with kind of Marxist and socialist principles. Um, and Diana is taught there uh, as a vocational teacher for several years. Mm -hmm. He created 18 murals um, for the Warisata school. And the Warisata school, after a few years, started to receive international attention. Um, so delegates from Peru and Mexico and even the United States were sent to the Warisata school right. to see it as an example. Uh, 
and so it was a it was a foundational moment and school, but it also drew political opposition. Um, and so as more conservative factors started to come into play, Yanis left the school, was, went into exile for a year in 1936, and then left the country. This is why he was traveling around in Mexico and Argentina. <laughs> Um, and the school itself started to receive political pressure and eventually closed and the murals were he painted all 18 of them were destroyed. Um, and so this is a very, uh, you know, intense political moment. Um, and that's somewhat what is going on in these murals as well, this depiction of this, this, this political tension between, um, you know, Marxism and more conservative forces. Absolutely. And like, you know, like you're saying, it's, this was a transformative moment in Bolivia. It was his formative years and it has such a, this image, the, uh, this painting is so personal. It's very, you can tell it has that very intimate aspect. And yes, it was definitely um, very much in tune with the Marxist and Trotskyite uh, like movements that, you know, Juan Lechín Oquendo, for example, led and he, and, and also it's so interesting that he chose to also travel just within South America and or mm -hmm. Latin, well, North America, Latin, Central America, which is Mexico. And, uh, but he didn't go to Europe or anything else. So that, 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 that's also like very telling of him because he could have, he could have, I think he could have perfectly well done that, but it was a very different, like sort of political time. And, and um, I think that's a very interesting uh, point. Well, and that's a little bit reminiscent of the 1930s. And the 1930s in Europe were actually a diff very difficult moment to travel with the rise of fascism, the rise of you know Hitler in, in Spain. So he he probably chose to turn his eyes to Mexico um, and then eventually the United States as models for places of artistic um, production. Um, I'm going to keep moving forward so that we can just see some of these comparisons. I also put this in uh, the detail of the Warisata school. Um, and this, again, to me, is evidence that he probably saw Rivera's um, uh, creation mural in the National Preparatory School when he was traveling in Mexico in the late 1930s, uh, because the formal sim similarities are just so close um, here. Um, and I also have this, um, this drawing that, again, not specifically a preparatory drawing, although the bottom section is exactly um, the same, but it references his time in the Warisata school and the revolutionary nature of the Warisata school. Yeah, pedimos escuela, we ask, and yes, they were, they were demanding, like, rights, I mean, the, and that's what the, you know, like, very basic rights. And that's what the 1952 revolution did. It gave them land and we were no longer this medieval serfdom. And also it gave them the famous universal vote, which was uh, that they got to vote for the first time. They, I mean, it was almost, that's that's why it was a revolution. They, that it was something unthought of that they would be able to vote or get any land. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, this was, again, as you mentioned, an absolutely pivotal moment and an important, um, he was in this place at this time, um, which put him at the center of political tensions um, going on. Uh, yeah. I also put in this image of Diego Rivera, and I think this one mm. is from his second trip to Mexico. So again, to give you a little bit of background, he was in Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, he went to Chile, Argentina, and Mexico in the late 1930s, uh, basically to stay out of the, Bol the Bolivian environment. But then he returned to Bolivia in the early 1940s, and he had several exhibitions there, um, which really brought him uh, to attention. Um, he had an exhibition in, um, in 1941 at the Palacio Municipal with many of his large scale paintings, which I think are some of the ones that are on um, display in the gallery. He then had an exhibition of right. his, his print work um, in 1946. Um, and then he decided to go, I'm, I'm sorry, 1944, I gave you the wrong date. 1944 was the print exhibition mm -hmm. also in La Paz in Bolivia. Right. Um, and this also says that he was integrated into the larger Bolivian art scene, which is all the more surprising um, that <laughs> yeah. his work has been kind of written out of Bolivian history. And so, I mean, it's very, very, I mean, he was very much a presence. He was written up by critics in the papers. He was um, socializing with the most important art figures in um, Bolivia, some of the critics. Yeah. And so he was very well known um, in the 1940s. 
1945, he wanted to go on a tour to take his work uh, abroad and see he ended up on a trip to Ecuador and Peru and then ultimately ended up in Mexico, um, where mm -hmm. this time is when he met with Diego Rivera um, and Rivera wrote the preface for his exhibition at the um, Palacio de Bellas Artes. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think this is the time when he drew this portrait of Diego Rivera, which is, uh, you know, graphite portrait on uh, paper. Right. So, uh, and uh, um, that's so, uh, I mean, interesting that, you know, you were saying he, he actually met Rivera mm -hmm. and, uh, and sort of, I, I think, I think he is really validating um, Ilanes in so many ways. And I think it was, uh, fantastic that they met but also I think this idea that he sort of you know he was so important during the 1940s and then he sort of disappeared it's kind of this systemic erasure the uh, of, of his love of this whole figure and this and of this like critical and transformative time so I mean it's just so sad and uh that the the, the, the he disappeared, but I'm so glad you brought him. <laughs> well, the paintings have been found. And I mean, I think this really changes the whole narrative of what indigenismo was in Bolivia, um, that there was a counter narrative to the Cecilio Guzman de Rojas and um, and the National Fine Arts School, um, that the indigenismo and art production in Bolivia was more rich and layered and sophisticated that, than we ever um, knew. Um, and so yeah. I'm keeping an eye on time here. And I know that I wanted yes. to show you some of, some of the prints um, and so these are probably prints that were made for his 1944 exhibition. I've just put a few of them in here um, that um, were in his 1944 exhibition, and many of them he took with him also to Mexico and on his um, tour. But he he was not just a master of oil painting, but his graphic design. I mean, it was just the prints are bold and, and you know have a a stark kind of um, geometric style. There's a blockiness to them, almost a stone like quality um, that is a bit again reminiscent of perhaps um, the ruins of Tiwanaku or the thing the pre Columbian yes. areas that he would have seen. Um, and so he has this this modernist visual eye that is also tying together with his his heritage and um, his context. Um, and so I'm going to just kind of stop, go through a few of these images so that you yeah, can see them rather than talking through them in depth, um, but just to give you a variety of his. Of yeah, his and they're work. like so, but also that I think also that they're so dark. I'm glad mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I, I know that it's obviously the technique, but I think it sort of adds and look at this allergy. I mean, it's like this allergy to the entire, like to the, to the, the war, I mean, and all the artists of that time, like Guzman de Rojas, uh, they all went either as like journalists, you know, war journalists to document sort of the war, mm -hmm. or they went as, um, you know, in order to like participate, to actually participate in the war. So, I mean, this is a great elegy to all that we were talking about, all this, you know, mm -hmm. transformative moment. And it's, but it's incredibly intense and so dark and, I, I don't know, it's, yeah, it's almost chilling, but it's fantastic. Well, really, and the interesting juxtapositions of scale as well. I mean, he was interested in narrative and telling the story with the large scale um, head and arms yes. in the foreground, um, which is juxtaposed with the scale in the background. Uh, and so mm -hmm. he's he's just kind of a, a master at at storytelling, um, yes. at you know capturing um, the way that the you know the the contrast here. Also, I'm looking at Farias or outcasts um, with laquitas. So this this yeah. contrast between the local traditions and those who are suffering in great poverty because of the circumstances of, of war or you know, changing political situations or class structures. I mean, he captures both of those things in his prints. Um, yes, I think um, you, you hit the spot, like he really is a great narrator and narrates you know, these differences, like, you know, in class, in history, oh, and this is such a fantastic, Laura Maldita, I mean, talking about, you know, the metal, el metal del diablo, the, the you know, it's, it's such a fantastic um, narration, narrative. And, and just yeah, Passive. absolutely. The tragedy of the mines um, and the allegorical, I mean, the, the tentacles that are or the allegorical monster that is kind of reaching up out of the earth and capturing um, this figure who's being strangled. And I mean, it just, uh, he he just has a sense of the story of his people. Um, yes. 
And, you know, also this is one of his uh, li very political um, lithographs. And I put a uh, little bit of the history here. You know, what was the significance of June 7th of 1939, um, which is it refers to the tensions regarding exports, either the nationalization of of property yes. uh, of the tin mines or does the money all flow out of the country? And so these are the issues that were, um, you know, at stake at this particular moment. And then the forces behind who were trying to destroy yeah. um that that law and and also i mean like the the mines have been at the forefront of bolivian history mm -hmm. since the conquest you yeah. know that like mm -hmm. we kind of completely depleted now during the tin mine the, and the tin mines were actually also you know but still like we didn't resolve her country <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking back to the colonial images of the the silver mines in Potosí. I mean, so this the mines go back; to, they have a long colonial history and a history of exploitation of land and people. Um, exactly. Again, one of his prints here, um, the skull and the llama. Um, that's actually a, a spelling error there. I just saw it, but um, the um, we're looking here at the uh, image of the sun gate of the Tiwanaku. And I just wanted to show that was this was actually a direct quote. Um, this was a moment of archaeological excavation and archaeological discovery. And he was paying attention to um, these these movements and taking pride in um, the ancient um, this, uh, Tiwanaku sources. And so you can see his, his graphic design in the background is actually a direct quote um, from the gate of the sun in um, Tiwanaku. Yes. Uh, and, um, okay. yeah, oh, ahead. sorry. Mentioning the, uh, and also like going back to mentioning the Tiwanakota um, uh, civilization, but also so interesting that you brought up the archaeological, you know, excavations because there were also like archaeological um, excavations, so to speak, done at the lake and that the lake did yes. and that's how we knew that they did you know a lot of the offerings and they brought out the pumas and the and the and the sun symbols which is which is so interesting that he was actually interested in that sort of archaeological you know sort of mm -hmm. discovery and finding and learning so the last set of images that I have, and I'll just show these a little bit quickly so we have time for some questions, are some of his drawings. And I just pulled a selection of his drawings. Um, but what I think is interesting here is I think these are probably um, source material for his murals at the Warisata School. Um, because yeah. one of the critics that talked about the Warisata School is, is uh, mentioned um, the geometric blocky quality of some of his images. And those were often around the larger murals. Um, and mm -hmm. so you can see here um, that he was probably looking at, um, you know, pre-Columbian motifs from from the region um, and simplifying his Absolutely. designs. And the and the work on on graph paper here is to expand and enlarge um, this imagery. So this is probably preparatory material for some of those um, murals uh, that he made. Yes, absolutely. And and I guess it also reminds me, uh, not not specifically these, but the ones uh, the, that you'll show later on, it kind of also re reminds me of Rivera and how he would make the, you know, tons and tons of these little, of these drawings mm -hmm. that he would also give out. I mean, I don't think Yanis <laughs> gave yeah. them out like Diego Rivera did, but, um, but yeah, they, they, they have sort of, um, I think they were preparatory, and especially because he was self-taught. But mm -hmm. that was not uncommon during that time. Yeah, we didn't have a San Fernando <laughs> academic yeah. school like Mexico had. So, mm -hmm. but I mean, self-taught. I also does not mean he did not have exposure to books and Absolutely. and learning peoples. And I mean, this was not an artist working in isolation. I mean, he certainly mm -hmm. knew. He knew modernist sources. He knew, um, you know, philosophy. He was reading, uh, and so he's very much producing in within a larger intellectual context. Even if he didn't have Absolutely. formal training within a national art school. Yes. Um, so a last few images are just to show the diversity of his his stylistic approach. I mean, here we're looking at a vegetation study, and you yeah. go from those geometric blocky lines to the sinuous organic lines um, that are just beautiful. I mean, he's really capturing um, the flora, the fauna, um, what he sees. And so I just, I, it's an unfinished drawing, but it's just a beautiful capturing of that space. 
Um, and then he had an ability with caricature. I mean, these are <laughs> looking at old man and old woman, um, but this through the exaggeration, not only caricature, but also costume. Um, yes. You know, he's looking very closely at, at costume uh, at, in both of them are in profile so that you get a sense of the details, the design, the characteristics of costume um, in, in his drawings. Yeah. And in the Warisata school, one of the workshops and one of the importance that was placed in these community workshops was the garments and the costumes, mm -hmm. because there was also a, like you like you mentioned, it was this community teaching where, where they would also continue their, you know, their rituals, their their, their own like, you know, um, mm -hmm. their own culture. Absolutely. And so just a last um, few images. Again, this I, I put these in more to show um, the breadth of his ability to produce in, in multiple media, um, in, in oil painting, in mural painting, in printmaking, um, and in drawing in various different styles and his, ob his observation abilities as well. So these are just a last few drawings to show the depth of his, of his practice. Yeah, I know. Thank you. It's, um, it's so important to also see the depth uh, of any artist, and this clearly gives us a great insight into him. Mm -hmm. So, so this is is my last image, but I would just want to wrap up, and we'll get to the questions in just a second. Um, but I want to wrap up with the kind of mystery of Yanes at the end. Um, so after his time in Mexico um, with Diego Rivera um, and his show at the Palacio de Bellas Artes, he then went to the United States, and he was the recipient of a Guggenheim grant um, that he he wrote. We have the we actually have in the archive the Guggenheim grant papers, uh, but he never picked up the grant, and this was in 1946. So he was awarded a grant. He never picked it up and the trail goes cold. His paintings stayed in New York. He never had another exhibition. Um, there is reference around 1960 that he might have still been alive, but we have no idea what happened to Lianes after 1946. There's a, just a completely cold trail. Uh, and so part of this, is, you know, we don't know if he went back to Mexico or if he went back to um, Bolivia. His paintings stayed in the United States, which is partly why um, his story hasn't been told in Bolivia. Um, mm -hmm. So this, this, I think this, this end, um, this, we don't know if it was a tragic end, this, this mysterious end, I should say, to yes. his story <laughs> is partly why um, the narrative has not been continued and he has not been incorporated into our larger understanding of both Bolivian art history and Latin American art history. Yes, and it's so sad because it was both, yes, this sort of sudden mysterious disappearance and this sort of systemic sort of erasure of his like this biting criticism that he had during that time, even though he was, of course, very, you know, well known during the 40s. So, I mean, it's kind of sad how how it would have changed. Uh, it's hard to tell. I mean, that, that 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 that's sort of a good question to, you know, for the future, like continue to ask our ourselves um so maybe we should move on to the q a like <laughs> yeah. the, uh, I, I hope everybody had a um a time to look at them um let's see do you do, are you looking at the questions yes well? i'm looking at them right now i mean i think we can just i can just go through in order a little bit it says do we know if the artist had access to western artworks or at least photographs absolutely um i mean yes. this was uh, he did not travel to Europe, um, but this was a moment when, for example, in Imauta, um, uh, um, Mariatigi wrote journal articles about surrealism, about German expressionism, about futurism, um, and then there were also many journals um, that circulated historical um, knowledge of European art. So th this was a moment of print culture. In the 1920s, there was an explosion in small journals throughout Latin America and a circulation of journals from the United States. So he probably would have seen these things in black and white um, in photographs, but absolutely would have known a larger world context. Um, for and then, uh, yeah, and like we said, before in Oruro, it was a very wealthy town and there was a lot of intellectual production and you had like a lot of artists that were looking there and uh, and you know the, even though they were self-taught like you said mm -hmm. they were exposed to a lot of information so mm -hmm. yes absolutely and, and so there was a there's a related question the th the, about whether he was aware of European artists and movement so the answer is absolutely yes. yes I don't know if there's a specific I mean he doesn't seem to be aligning himself with a specific movement I would actually argue from looking at his paintings that he was more interested in aligning himself 
with a Latin American sensibility, um, with Mexico, with Argentina, with social realism. Um, and I think it was deliberate on his part. It was it was Absolutely. a choice um, because the 1930s were a move away from this kind of admiration of Europe. They saw Europe as falling into fascism and, and infighting. And there was definite artists were returning from Europe in the 1930s, not staying in Europe um, and looking to um, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico and New York as places as different kinds of centers. So certainly he knew European art, um, but was probably deliberately aligning himself with um, with um, American traditions. So I'm looking yeah, at and they align well with his political views and his uh, his upbringing and his uh, livelihood as well. Yeah, like as well. Uh, there's a question, I say, paintings look markedly different from other Latin American artists. Do you think mm -hmm. this might relate to Bolivian culture and specifically his artistic choice? Uh, and so mm -hmm. absolutely, I think, I think it's, well, I, I would actually say it goes both ways. I mean, on the one hand, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think he was specifically aligning with his regional culture and trying to make something that um, that re referenced Aymara tradition um, yes. from his the region in Bolivia. But at the same time, um, he was in dialogue with other artists. I mean, I especially mm -hmm. mentioned Diego Rivera. Um, I think he knew the work of Antonio Berni in um, in Argentina, who was also doing kind of social realist work and kind of quasi surrealist work. Um, so I, th I think he was both. I mean, he wanted to distinguish himself um, as specifically with region and with color is one of the ways that he did that. The bold colors of the textiles and the bold colors of the, you know, the brightness of the Andean sky at such a high altitude. I think that is something that he's capturing, but also aligning with other um, works. And and I would also add that um, the, the these really bright colors, the Aymaras use like sort of uh, in the Andean region, they purposefully use because it's also in contrast with the very, because it's a very bare land. I mean, it's very, you know, it's, it's imposed and you have the mountains, but it's all in very monochrome colors. So I think the the, the these bright colors is a, it's a much needed sort of a, they really need it and they use it purposefully in all of their in all of their costumes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then um, let's see. Was the Warisata school open to one? It was only open to men. <laughs> yeah. Um, is unfortunate. So that, I mean, I find this was, I'll kind of answer in a broad way, but this is was something that was very particular to revolutionary movements. They were progressive in their political and class structural outlook, but tended to be a more conservative and, and machista towards feminism came later to to basically to yes. Latin America. I mean, it, it, revolution came first. And unfortunately, um, yes. it took a while longer to incorporate um, women into a more kind of progressive worldview in terms of worthy of education. So yes, unfortunately, it was not yeah, um, I mean, they're the serfdom, I think, mm -hmm. and the revolution was like something that had to be taken off, uh, that had to be taken care of mm -hmm. uh, first. And then, yes, woman. But that came much, much later, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and, so were his uh, prints ever published? Um, as far as I know, no. Um, with I um, mean, so uh, I've gone through the archive quite um, thoroughly. I mean, there were there were some prints that were published at the time in the newspaper of his of of his um, exhibition. So in Bolivian newspapers as a critical response to his works, but never in a as far as I know, never in a journal that published them or circulated them more widely um, outside. Um, it's, he, he seemed to have them with him when he was traveling in 1946, and they never received a larger um, circulation of, of, of publication. Yeah. Yeah. And the next question deals with a little bit the, the my last statement. So his literal disappearance yeah. in the United States in the 1940s. Um, I hope that this presentation and this this circulation of of imagery will inspire um, more research because the answer is at this point is unknown. Um, we we do yes. not know what what happened. Um, maybe more as as he becomes more known as an artist maybe more information will come forward. Um, but at this point, his disappearance remains a mystery. Um, yes, it's hard to tell. And I, yes, I hope this will really um, 
you know, bring a, a wider study of him. It would be very interesting if people, you know, if the if people know more about him or have heard in Bolivia. Yeah. Uh, then the last questions, I guess. Um, how come did you have? How come you have? Did you have access to the painter and the gallery decided to present him today? The last uh, question. Oh, oh, the last question. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Um, so as I mean, for, for me as a specialist in indigenism in the Andean region, um, the, the gallery contacted me, but I had no knowledge of this artist, but they have the full archive, the archive, um, of which means newspaper clippings and um, and letters and reviews. I mean, there are literally hundreds of documents um, that talk of that, that re that review his work and the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did have access to scans of his of his archive and beautiful high quality uh, digital images of of his work. Um, but this this is a brand new expl exploration. Um, and so this this work came to view. Um, I mean, I think Rachel might be able to answer a little better this last question than, than I came about how um, I know that the work was in New York until 1978. And then it went through a kind of a series of sales and ended up in Paris um, and came into the position possession of the the gallery um but the archive is with the with the um with the ex with the images uh and so this is a kind of renewal of this artist's work and trying to get information out there about him yeah this was a real you know uh very as i said at the beginning and a very rare opportunity like this doesn't happen that often to read discover an artist and thank goodness he left his you know <laughs> archive behind otherwise um, she would have been completely lost I imagine yeah thanks I'm looking there looks like there are two more questions um I'm look can we say um there was a formal modernist movement in Bolivia at the beginning of the 20th uh, the 20th century I would say that there were artists who were in, engaged with modernist ideas um in mm -hmm. artists who were aligned with the broader Andean in indigenism, um, but a, a group that that named themselves or with a manifesto in the in the in the ideas of a European modernist movement, not so much. But so artists were certainly aware and certainly in in dialogue. It became much more. I would say that the that modernism became much more fully developed in Bolivia after um, the 1952 revolution and the arrival of abstract tendencies. And that's actually a project that I'm working on right now um, is looking at. Mm -hmm abstraction in the Andean countries. And so I think it became a more fully formed modernist movement a little bit later than, than the early 20th century. And that was also, again, because part of our very, uh, our hard historical introduction into modernism mm -hmm. as a whole, you know, it was just in 1952 that we're like, that we will, that we were uh, no longer served, you know, in a medieval serfdom state and, and uh, you know, had the agrarian revolution. So it only makes sense that, you know, our modernism would even come a little later than the, even the art, the Latin American art um, modernism in general. The, the last question that I see here is, um, could you speak to why the U.S. was a destination for him and were there particular people welcoming him there? Um, and so I think uh, the U.S. as a destination probably came from his dialogue with Rivera and Orozco, who yes. had great success um, in the United States, who did multiple commissions, who had connections in New York. Um, and I don't know if there was a specific um, person. He did seem to have a, a friends in, in New York, but there doesn't seem to be a specific gallery. Um, but also the 1940s was a moment of opening up and great interest in Latin American art because of political Pan-Americanism and the beginnings of the Cold War. Um, there was a great draw for Latin American artists to go to New York and take advantage of grant programs um, mm -hmm. that were being offered in the region because of the political circumstances at um, that at at that moment. So I think um, it's kind of a natural choice for the the, the circumstances yeah. in 1946, just after World War II. Yeah, I and mean, like we mentioned, Europe was not the place to be during that time. So I think we have answered all of the last questions. I hope that this has been an informative yes. uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. Oops, and I will or exactly. try to put up the last slide and here. With the last slide. Yes, but it was, um, again, like Michelle, it was wonderful to be in this conversation mm -hmm. and uh, rediscover this artist. And yes, thank you to everyone for listening us to listening to us. And yes, I also hope it was informative. <laughs>
So, and thank you so much. And so this, this slide here is just a reminder to please join for the next event, um, which is entitled the, Ven the Venice Biennale and the Successionists of Sa Pesaro. Uh, and so that would be on Monday, October 16th. Um, so thank you so much to everyone. It was a pleasure to discuss this fantastic um, Bolivian artist. And um, I'm happy to take any questions by email if anything one thinks of anything after the fact. And thank you so much to Carolina for being an interlocutor um, for this wonderful discussion. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Thank you to everyone and um, everybody have a wonderful day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank bye you bye. for listening.